glad you're here. There are a few announcements before we begin our service. First of all, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all fathers and father figures. Uh, this is a wonderful day, and to kind of honor that day, we will have coffee hour after church with some treats and, of course, coffee. So I hope you stay. This is a good opportunity to, to get to know each other uh, over some coffee and some treats. Uh, but know that there's coffee always back there. You can help yourself right now if you want to have a cup of coffee during the service. That's fine. Coffee, there's hot water for tea, there's even an espresso if you know how to use it. <laughs> so uh, help yourselves there. So uh, prayer concerns, we lift up those uh, names. If you walked in, you probably, hopefully, received a bulletin. And on the back, we have some uh, prayer concerns. We always lift up those names in prayer. And we uh, ask for other names. Uh, there is one more addition. We ask for prayers for Linda Kayan. This is uh, Jim's sister. And we will lift her up in prayer and add her to our prayer list. Are there other prayers uh, that we can lift up? Joy's concerns. Levi. Yes, sir. On Friday, it was Ruthie's birthday. Ruthie's birthday. On Friday. Well, that is a wonderful celebration. Ruthie is one, one, two, two. Oh Has time? Where did time go? <laughs> Tell us about it. Yeah, right. I don't know. You lived it for two years. Spend some time with her. Yeah. <laughs> two years. Two years old. Congratulations. Happy birthday, Ruthie. And the family is here to celebrate. How wonderful. What other joys can we lift up today? Yes, Pat. To Lindsay's brother today, uh, John, he is doing better. He said he was in his apartment in regular socks, and he slid, and he <laughs> injured the muscle all the way from his tailbone all the way down one leg. And I told John, I said, you're not a gymnast. He said, no, I'm not. He hopes to be out of rehab within a week or so. He lives in Bellevue, and I asked for prayers for me. I go up. Thursday night and Friday for some surgery in Seattle. I'll be home Sunday, Saturday. So we lift up prayers for Pat as she travels to Seattle for some uh, procedures, and also for John, for uh, Lindsay's brother, who's doing so much better. We're so glad to hear that. Other joys and concerns that we can lift up today. So I see Paul back there. School's out for the summer. School's <laughs> out for summer. Okay, you all know the reference I'm saying. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, a teacher, a teacher would celebrate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right. Um, <laughs> now you just have to beat the kids, didn't you? <laughs> and a prayer concern, a joy, Denny. change and so part of that change is how we are molded in different ways. 
So, as you're doing that, before we start our service, I would like everyone to just stand up and reach out to your neighbor and say, we're glad you're here.
come now to a time of prayer. So let us quiet our hearts and minds as we turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, we join our voices to praise you today. We sing of your wonders. We give thanks for your grace and your care. We celebrate the joys of life that you have blessed us with. Family, friends, new relationships, deeper relationships, new life, transformed lives, reconciliation and restoration. On this day, we are especially grateful for the gifts of fathers and all the father figures in our lives. We thank you for the many ways that our fathers have shaped us, for their example and their love. Yet we also pray for those who have painful relationships with their fathers, those who are estranged from their fathers, and fathers who are estranged from their children. We pray for all families, O oh God, for parents, for children, for extended families and families that are chosen through caring circumstances. We pray for your healing touch to all who are in need. We pray for the hurting, for the ill. We lift up those names that we spoke earlier. We ask for healing, for restoration. We pray for the lonely, for the grieving. We ask for your comforting presence in their lives. We now, Lord, lift up those names that we carry on our hearts, those concerns that we silently keep to ourselves, those joys that we have not spoken. Hear now our silent prayers, O oh Lord. Gracious God, we pray for this community. We pray for this congregation that it may continue to be a blessing in this place where it has been for decades. We pray that all those that walk through our doors may know your love through each of us. We thank you for the wonderful and amazing possibility for relationships and ministry. Help us to see them, O oh Lord. Help us to move toward them. We ask that you continue to guide us, that you continue to make us be a part of your work in this community and in the world. We join our voices together, O oh God, lifting this prayer to you, and we pray for the coming of your kingdom, using the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. The message. The good news of Jesus Christ, the message, begins here, following to the letter, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Watch closely. I'm sending my preacher ahead of you. He'll make the road smooth for you. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road smooth and straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wild, preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem, and as they confessed their sins, were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair hobbit tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locusts and wild field honey. 
As he preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama, to whom I am a mere stagehand, will change your life. I am baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment he came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's Spirit, looking like a dove, come down on him, along with the Spirit, a voice. You are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. At once, this same Spirit pushed Jesus out into the wild. For forty wilderness days and nights, he was tested by Satan. Wild animals were his companions, and angels took care of him. This is the reading of the scripture. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned earlier, today we continue our sermon series titled Reshaped. And last week we turned to Jeremiah to help us understand that God, the divine potter, continually molds us and reshapes us like clay on a potter's wheel. And today we'll continue our conversation on change through the story of Jesus' baptism as found in the Gospel of Mark. But first I have a joke for you. A Buddhist monk ordered a loaded hot dog from a street vendor and handed him a $20 bill. And the vendor took the cash and then fixed the hot dog, gave it to the monk, and then looked to the next person in line. And the monk waited for a while, and the vendor did nothing but stare back at him. And then awkwardly, the monk said, well, um, what about my change? Ah, replied the hot dog vendor, change must come from within. <laughs> so this morning we continue exploring change, and we encounter this deep truth about change. It is an external process as well as an internal process. So today's text from Mark uses this wonderful phrase to describe the baptism of Jesus. In the paraphrase known as the message, it says, I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. This baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. So what does it mean to change from the inside out? Let's take a look at Mark to see what we can learn. Mark is a unique gospel for several reasons. First of all, it's the oldest gospel. Scholars believe that it was written sometime between 65 and 75 CE, around the time of the Jewish war with Rome. Not only is it the oldest gospel, it's the shortest gospel. It was first an oral telling of Jesus Christ life and his ministry before it was ever written down. So another thing that is unique is that it doesn't include many, many of the greatest hits that you would think about of Jesus' life. For example, the Golden Rule, the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, and most notably, the story of Jesus' birth. Mark's gospel opens with Jesus' baptism. Or more precisely, with John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, preparing the way for Jesus. John appears first preaching, calling for people to be baptized. And when Jesus is finally baptized by John, a voice from heaven calls out saying, This is my beloved Son. Now, baptism was a public ritual that made public 
his decision to be part of the covenant with God. Baptism in Jesus' time was considered an entrance into this relationship with God. So Jesus' baptism marks the very beginning of his ministry. And it wasn't just this entrance into a covenant with God. It was also a very public declaration of that person being baptized would turn away from anything <coughs> that would prevent a deeper relationship with God. Now, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, another translation, uses the original Greek to translate and has these words, John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. <coughs> the paraphrase known as a message translated translates it as a life change that leads to the forgiveness of sins. Repentance, life change, either way the Greek original word is metanoia. That's your word for the day. Metanoia, the Greek word which means to have a change of heart. It literally means to turn around. Metanoia means you're going one direction and you literally turn around. So it's very significant that Mark's gospel places Jesus' baptism and not his birth at the very beginning of the gospel. The very first words of this gospel are telling us something important. The good news of Jesus Christ begins here. Here, with this moment of heart-changing, repenting, <coughs> turning around. This is the good news. You know, we hear that word good news a lot, the good news of the gospel. Well, here it is. This is the good news. The good news is that there is hope for all of us. In our denomination, the disciples, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, baptism is more than just a physical external act. There is a belief that through our baptism there is then an intimate relationship, a powerful union with God through the Holy Spirit. And the water, the water symbolically washes away the old and makes us new once more. And this is the metanoia, the, the transformation that begins from the inside out. God is working within us, transforming us, molding us, reshaping us until the outside reflects what is inside. I like that idea of the outside reflecting what is inside. If we carry that joy of being transformed and being in relationship with God, how are we reflecting that? The good news is that we are invited into this kind of change. We are invited to, to enter into this renewed covenant with God, this renewed spirit, and therefore show the world this joy, this vitality to uh, all those around us. And as I mentioned last week, change is a constant. Change will happen to all of us. And again, as I mentioned last week, a little recap, change can be forced on us by a crisis, a health crisis, maybe, or something outside of our control, or it can happen to us by chance. Or as Jesus' baptism illustrates, we can choose the change. Now this is a healthy way to change, to choose to change, to acknowledge that there needs to be a change in some aspect of our life and then work towards that goal. And this is that inside-out change that happens in us and through us when we let God mold us and shape us. And spiritual growth happens when we lean into that change, when we allow God to change us. So how can we lean into this change? I have a few steps for you. First of all, the first step is this, confession. Confession is good for the soul. 
John's baptism includes a confession, a repentance for forgiveness. So we can think of this confession as this beginning, this key to the inner work that needs to happen. It's an acknowledgement to ourselves, to our community, that something needs to happen. A change needs to occur. Confession at its most basic means this, an acknowledgement, an admission that something is not working or something needs to be improved. And this unknown then is brought to light through our confession. I recently heard this story as I was driving. I listened to NPR. And there's never a day when I don't learn something. And I heard this story and it really, it really made me think about confession and change. The story is this. Inside a state prison near Stillwater, Minnesota, a small group of men gather to discuss an article for the prison mirror. This is a newspaper written by incarcerated men in the Minnesota Correctional Facility. The Prison Mirror is one of the oldest newspapers in the country. There are many newspapers written by people incarcerated. And this particular one has been running since 1887. That's a long time. Now, writing for this newspaper is an opportunity for those in prison. It's an opportunity. It teaches skills that many never learned. For example, the senior editor for the paper says, including all sides to a story has changed the way he thinks about the world. He's been in and out of prison multiple times. He's now in for assault. And he says, the newspaper is helping me break this cycle. And then he confesses the following in this interview. He says, for the first 40 years of my life, any other opinion than mine did not matter. But now, just having to be objective and to put stories together that aren't one-sided, I am now starting to practice in my own life a lot of fighting against bias. And that's a big thing, he says. For another inmate who's serving a life sentence, writing for the paper isn't just about journalism. It's about the change that has occurred in him as a result of that writing. He explains about this change, saying, when we first come to prison, it's a journey to figure out how to do this time. We come here, and we're mad at the world that life didn't work out. We spend day after day after day trying to figure out and find that one moment where if we would have made a different decision, everything would have gone right. And then he says, but then we get mad at the people around us for nobody helping us in that one moment. He then confesses. And it's a journey to finally get to that point where we take responsibility for our own actions. And then we can finally grow. And yet another inmate who began writing an advice column in the prison paper explains the need for change this way. You have a choice while you're here. You can change, or you can go back out there and do the same thing that got you in here in the first place. You can go back out there and at least try to make a difference. That is this change process. And for these prison journalists and those that are helping them, the goal is to offer hope. The goal is to offer hope, but also the tools that they may need to start over when they get a chance to. The story, for me, gets to the heart of change. It begins with a confession that life isn't the way it was supposed to be. A confession
confession that maybe we are responsible for where we are, a confession that, that we're not living the life that God wants us to live. And then there's that hard work that needs to follow that confession, that hard work of change. And as these men in prison teach us, it takes time. It takes effort. It's difficult. But ultimately, if we accept that change needs to happen, we are better for it. So that first step is to confess, to turn around, metanoia. And then a very, very, very important step is to acknowledge the feelings that come with that change. All kinds of emotions can be stirred up within us when our brain encounters change. Anger, anxiety, fear, sadness, grief, excitement. Now many of us have experienced times when we try to undergo change in our lives without dealing with those feelings that come up. And when you don't deal with those feelings, it can cause some real problems. When you live in that constant fear or anxiety or anger. So that second step after you confess is acknowledge those feelings. Acknowledge. Find someone to talk to if you need to. And share. Find a group of people that might be dealing with the same changes that you are dealing with. And find that support that you need. You see, change is happening to all of us. To you, to me, everyone around us is experiencing change. And our scripture teaches us that change, even for Jesus, was inevitable. His baptism marked the beginning of his ministry. It was this turning point, this beginning of a deeper change for himself. For his followers, for the world. So why a sermon on change? Actually, four sermons on change. <laughs> why? Well, because as I mentioned before, change happens all the time. And we're not immune to it, even as a congregation. It happens to us on a personal level, but it happens at this communal level as well. It's happening to our society. And many institutions are dealing with change, including churches. So how do we deal with change? It's important how we deal with change. Our personal health is at risk if we don't deal with change in a, in a healthy manner. The health of our institutions depends on how we deal with change or don't deal with change. Do we acknowledge it? Do we ignore it? Do we just let it go? As our congregation celebrates our 75th anniversary, 75 years, it's helpful to see the many ways that this congregation has changed through the decades. From a small group of women looking for a Bible study opportunity in those early days of Richland, in the mid-1940s, to, to the building of not one, but two buildings, to the longtime pastors that have faithfully led and guided the people that have walked through those doors and sat in these pews, to the present day. So many changes, and even in the four years I've been here, I've seen many changes. And what do all those people that have been part of this congregation for 75 years, what do they all have in common? Well, change. That is one thing we all have in common. But there's one thing to remember. Change is neutral. It's not bad. It's not good. It just is. What is not neutral is the way we deal with change. So this is a moment where I'm going to invite you to take your Play-Doh. If you don't have one and would like one, please let, raise your hand. So 
So take your credo. First, struggle with opening it. I just did. And then take the little, it's not a whole lot. Take your little play doh out. Okay, this is a chance to, to engage with your inner child. There's no judgment. This is a judgment free zone. Yeah, there you go. No names, because we're on we're on Facebook Live. <laughs> take, take the dough, roll it into a ball. Roll it into a ball. And you're changing that lump of clay to a ball. Did you have fun doing this when you were a kid? I did. It smells good? Uh -huh. Imagine how the Play-Doh feels about being turned into a ball. I know that's a silly question, but how would you feel if you were molded into something different? How would you feel? Now take a look at that ball. Look at it. It's something different. It went through a change, a transformation. Now it's something different. Now mine's not very good because I'm not paying attention. I'm trying to read at the same time. You might have turned it into a smooth and beautiful ball. You might have turned that bump into a beautiful ball. Now, now let's do something different with this ball. Take your little finger or some finger, thumb, and make a little indentation in, in the ball. And now what does it become? A tiny little bowl. Very good. <laughs> and our little Play-Doh lump, which we turned into a beautiful ball, is now a little bowl. Is it better than a bowl? No, it's just something different. Something else has changed from the inside out. <coughs> so how does the Play-Doh feel about being changed into a ball and now a bowl? Well, I know it's a silly question, but put yourself in that place of a Play-Doh. It's one thing, one way that we can think about our lives and, and the change. We are like that play though. Change happens. And sometimes we don't ask for it. Just like this didn't ask to be opened and played with. Sometimes we come through change looking like this beautiful ball, smooth, no lines. Sometimes we come out through change looking just perfect. And sometimes we come through change looking more like this little bowl. Not necessarily pretty, but very useful. But sometimes we come through change and we look just like a lump of clay. <laughs> but whether we like it or not, we are being reshaped. And, and while we don't get to choose the shape sometimes that we want to be, God can use us. God can use us even if, and especially if, we don't end up being what we thought we would be. Even if we end up being something different than we thought we could be at one point in our lives, God can use us always. You see, we are God's beloved children. We are being changed from the inside and out. And God will use us. God will use us continuously. Even as we are being changed, we are helping others change. We're helping our communities as well. God will use us to bring about change that is meaningful, that is helpful to our neighborhood, our community, our country, our world. We are the change that needs to happen. But first we acknowledge that change happens. And we deal with those emotions, whatever they may be that come up. So let's embrace change. Let's embrace change and allow God, the divine potter, to continually mold us, to continually reshape us.
future is, there our hearts will be also. Our offerings are the treasures that we freely and generously give for the transformation of our church and our world. We receive your gifts on Sunday before and after the service by placing your envelope in a basket in the narthex, or you may mail or drop your offering during the week into the church office. Let us offer all that we have and all that we are. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for the many blessings you have poured on each of us. Take these gifts and mold them to be the blessings that will be poured on others. Amen. <laughs>
life-giving God, you refresh us from the inside out with your water of life and spirit. Open us to your presence within us, and help us see how you are reshaping our spirits each day. As we leave this place, be with us, challenging us and molding us to your will. We pray in Jesus' name. As you are able for our final hymn, Hours of the Journey. Thank you. 